Hey, good morning. What a nice thing to see you guys sitting here in the sanctuary. We've got about 26 all told in the sanctuary this morning. And so <clears throat> for those of you at home still worshiping with us online, know that uh, you've got a nice congregation here this morning and welcome, welcome all of you. This is the first Sunday of Lent, February the 21st, 2021. What a week it has been. We have, uh, we've groused about our deep snow, but uh, we have not had any experience like our dear friends in Texas. God love them, it just has to be horrendous. Some years ago, I lived in Dallas, and uh, <clears throat> one of my fellow pastors, <clears throat> excuse me, in, uh, uh, in, in Dallas, uh, at the church where I was, um, they owned their own home, and uh, I can't remember what the occasion was, whether the power went out or whatever, but at any rate, one of the pipes in his house froze and burst, and I know what a mess that was. Can you imagine thousands upon thousands upon thousands of homes deluged with water after freezing cold temperatures? How can our hearts not go out to our brothers and sisters in Texas? What a what a trying week it has been, weather-wise. But we're, uh, we're doing much better here. And they say that uh, by the middle of the week, it'll be so warm, we'll be out in our tank tops and shorts. <laughs> well, not quite. <clears throat> I wouldn't put on a tank top and short, even if it was that warm. <laughs> So as we come into the first Sunday of Lent, uh, I have invited you, all of you here in the sanctuary, everywhere listening to me, I've invited you to uh, participate in the Lenten journey by writing a prayer, um, any kind of prayer that, uh, that touches you. Um, it's a good experience to write a prayer, first of all, and I encourage you to send it to me because every one of us has our own language expression. And I'm always humbled by the, by the variety of faith expressions that comes from the, from the gathered fa faith family. And so I'm looking forward to, uh, to receiving uh, some prayers. I'll use them during the, during the Lenten journey. Next Sunday, at 9 o'clock in Fellowship Hall, those of you who would like, <coughs> under the <coughs> leadership of uh, Paul Schaefer and Ed Mead, we will look at Adam Hamilton's work entitled Words of Life, Jesus and the Promise of the Ten Commandments Today. It should be a very interesting conversation. It'll be a 10-week study with a video and... Uh, and so I, I think it'll be a very nice experience. Those of you who want to do that, well, again, we'll be careful with our social distancing and wearing masks, but we ought to have some good conversation together. <clears throat> you know, there are some folks that just are so creative they can hardly stand it, and, and Loris is one of those folks. I'm just so thrilled by the creativity that comes out of this lady. And she's inviting us to add an extension to the prayer bl blanket project. And I think you've all read about it by now, looking at uh, doing a once a month craft project, uh, with a doing a variety of things each month and uh, working towards uh, producing items for, uh, for hopefully this fall in, in terms of the bazaar and, and uh, Oktoberfest, and so we'll see how that goes, Loris, and I hope you've get, been getting some calls already and folks saying, count me in. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to uh, how that will begin to develop over the coming weeks here. <clears throat> we would want to join with our dear brother Melvin as he... Uh, he and his family celebrate um, his, uh, his wife's um, birthday. Uh, I know that Melvin 
still has such a deep love place in his heart for Phyllis Ann, and, and I know that her family feels the same way. I'm sorry, I never got to know the, the lady, uh, the way many of you have had a chance to do that, but at any rate, Melvin, thank you for, and your family for the beautiful flowers, uh, red roses here this morning uh, in, in her love and memory. We've had three uh, uh, death experiences this week. Mark Frisch and family in the passing of his father, John. Uh, Bob Prather and family in the passing of his sister, Peggy. And yesterday morning we received the call that uh, Patty Marhenka had passed away. Uh, his wife, June, of course, is dealing with uh, some Alzheimer's issues, um, but uh, it continues to be in the nursing home. Uh, Patty's funeral will be uh, Wednesday, and I'm sure that the, I don't know, the information will be out today, tomorrow, whatever, um, but it'll be a, a noontime visitation and with service following. <clears throat> In terms of other prayer needs, uh, keep uh, Don and Mary Hill in our love and prayers. Mary fell and hurt her back uh, fairly severely. We need to pray for Don because he has to do all the cooking now. <laughs> so, uh, Larry Kemling, of course, Jason Smallwood, uh, John Moore. Uh, Billy Winton and her, uh, her niece Mary, uh, although Billy reports that Mary is doing better and uh, should be coming out of the hospital, uh, if not already out. Kylie Galbraith and her sister Lindsay, uh, Shirley Hutchinson, all folks with, uh, with special needs in, in our prayers, uh, certainly this day and in the days since we received that information. So I think with, with that um, before us, we are ready to uh, turn to our worship experience uh, together. And uh, as always, Bridie, if you'll lead us into those moments, please. Before we start the call to worship, it's good to greet Jane Dirks as our liturgist today, but uh, because, uh, because we were 
weathered out last Wednesday, I have a small dish of ashes. Uh, during the uh, <coughs> uh, offertory, I'll pass amongst the congregation. If, if you want a mark, I'll put an ash mark on your hand. You don't have to, but if that's meaningful to you, um, that can happen at that point. So, Jane, our call to worship. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascended to heaven or descend to Sheol, you are there. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Our gathering prayer. O God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but continue to create us, making us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives. May we, as First United Methodist Church, come to know the joy you give your people. Thank you for gathering us together this morning. We lift this prayer in Christ's name and spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, worship choir. As we gather with our children's time, let's sing, Jesus Loves Me. Am I not in the right place? <laughs> there you go.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. When I looked over at Judy and she looked at me, I thought I did a no-no for a minute. <laughs> uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today, boys and girls, doing a no-no. That means making a mistake. That means doing something that you know you probably shouldn't have done, but somehow, somehow, somehow you did it anyway. Oh, my goodness. Doing a no-no. So when you do a no-no, what do you think should happen? You think something should happen to you or for you? What do you, what do you think happens after you do a no-no? It's kind of like the young child who is walking down the street and there's a great big puddle right there in the middle of the street. You can see mom pulling the child away from the puddle and the, and the, and the little one just breaks away from mom and runs over and goes, gah, sploosh, right in the middle of the puddle. <laughs> And then turns around and looks at mom like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, I know that sometimes when we do no-nos, we're, um, we're sent to time out. <clears throat> there was a time when, when people thought that, uh, big people thought that if a youngster did a no-no, they deserved a swat on the behind. Uh, some people still do that. Some people decide they don't want to swat their kids on the behind, but they want to send them to time out, let them think about it. Uh, every family works out their own way of dealing with no-nos, don't they? The point is that when we do a no-no, we should expect something to happen to us. Something should happen to us. Somehow, we should be taught that doing no-nos is a no-no. <laughs> That's why they're called no-nos. <laughs> when we do something that we shouldn't do, something should happen to us to make us learn that doing no-nos is not a good thing. You know, God doesn't swat us on the behind. God doesn't even send us to time out. When we do a no-no in front of God, we know that God cries. It makes God cry. Because God is unhappy when we do no-nos. It makes God very sad. And we don't like to make God sad. And so when we do a no-no in front of God and we and we can just almost see the tears dripping out of God's eyes. It makes us feel not very good. And we think to ourselves, I'm not going to do that again because I don't want God to cry because of what I did. And so as we grow up, we learn to not do no no's in front of God. Sometimes it takes us a little longer than other times, boys and girls, but we all need to grow up and learn not to do no-nos in front of God. Because God will cry. And that makes us unhappy. Something to think about, isn't it? Something to think seriously about. And I know, boys and girls, that you're able to think about that. And I'm just sure that you do not want to make God cry. So let's pray together. Let's put our hands together. <clears throat> Say with me, dear God, thank you for loving me so much that when I do a no-no, and you cry, it makes me sad. Dear God, I'm going to work hard to not do no-nos in front of you. Take care of my family, take care of my church family, Take care of all the boys and girls all around the world. I pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Shane, if you'll come and give our words of invitation, and then during the offertory, I'll pass amongst the congregation. God comes to us in so many different ways, inviting us to be a part of the continuing act of creation. May these moments of bringing our lives and our gifts together become one of the ways we participate with God's ongoing process of creation. Gracious Lord, bless the gathering of these gifts brought from our lives and our resources. We dedicate them to your kingdom work. Together, we commit ourselves to that work. May those who receive blessings from these offerings be healed in the places of hurt and confusion. May we all experience your presence in our lives 
in new and empowering ways. Thank you, God. Amen. Our scripture for this morning from Mark is from Mark 1, verses 9 through 15. Mark's account of Jesus' baptism and temptation experience. In those days, Jesus came down from Nazareth and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And from 1 Peter for Christ also suffered for sins, once for all, the righteous for the, for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Thank you, Jane. It's always good to hear your voice. Uh, For the for the mark that we have gathered on our hand and our heart, let us take a moment and pray. Gracious and holy God, even as even as the mark of the ash is visible to us, yet even more important, your mark in our heart is even more present to us. And so as we enter these 40 days of Lenten journey, a faith-filled time of reflection and introspection, may it become rich to our hearts and souls. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm reminded of the preacher who uh, who said, you know, it's been a tough week. Three funerals, five meetings, plus trying to get ready for today's worship service, and I'm just, I've just been overwhelmed. He said, so I have to be honest and say, quite frankly, I, I really don't have anything planned for today, so... If a couple of you would just stand up and and tell me what your sins are, we'll kind of wing it from there. (laughs) Uh, Gosh. You know, and while that almost sounds repulsive and or frightening to us to think about standing up and speaking our sins out loud, indeed early Methodism did just that. Small class meetings, eight, ten, twelve people 
sitting in a home, working on growing their faith together. And one of the things that they did when they began was to, was to confess the sins that they had committed during that, that week since they had last met. They were open and honest. If you didn't want to do that, oh well, don't come. But if you want to be a part of this faith journey, then early Methodism said, then you're ready to lay your heart and soul out there for everyone to see. You know, we've journeyed a long way from that place, haven't we? We, uh, we talk about our privacy. We talk about just between me and God, and that's true. And yet we can become so private that, in fact, we become private even to ourselves. In which not only do we not confess our sins to anyone else, we don't even speak them to ourselves. And yet every week, at least once a week, as we speak the words that Jesus taught us, we say, lead us not into temptation. Forgive us our trespasses. Are those just words that we recite? Have they become part of our recitorial prog pr process? Do they come out of the mind only? Do they come out of the very edges of the mind and not the depth of the mind? Do they, do they not even touch our hearts? And so here's Jesus. Baptized this rugged Elijah-looking man standing in the Jordan River called John. Calling people to a place of repentance. An open experience. Come, repent. And Jesus went. Now Mark gives us such a brief Picture The other Gospels illuminate that experience for us. Mark just as a little pithy moment. Simply says, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart. We've talked about that. Torn apart. God tearing apart the heavens. And the Spirit descending like a dove on him and a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you am I, I am well pleased. And then something incredible happened. The spirit grabbed a hold of Jesus and drove him out into the wilderness. I can remember when I first saw that wilderness area. It was one of three times that I made a trip to, to the Holy Land. And that rugged terrain that rises up out of the Jordan Valley, barren, craggy, almost unwalkable, dry, dry, oh my gosh, 40 days in that wilderness, the thirst alone, let alone the heat. would cause your mind to go into spasms. Forty days. Forty days symbolic of the, of the 40 that happened again and again. The 40 years in the wilderness as, as the ancient Hebrews made their way out of captivity. You would have thought that would have done it, wouldn't you? If you're pulled out of captivity, don't you think you're about ready to listen? But no, and before that, 40 days of deluging 
rain as the ark rose. And now here's Jesus, 40 days in the wilderness, walking again the depth of, of Hebrew journey with Yahweh. Listening, praying, reflecting, meditating. My gosh, if you heard a voice saying, hey, you're one of my favorites, would you go out into the wilderness? Would that be the first thing you would do? Or would you want to rush home and say, hey, folks, hey, folks, I, I heard a voice, I heard a voice, hey! <laughs> what was Jesus thinking? What Jesus was thinking was that in spite of everything that happened to him, Jesus understood his humanity and he would not walk away from it, but rather he plunged himself into the depth of it. And that becomes critical for us as faith people in the Jesus Church today. We are not following an apparition, a floating spirit from somewhere, a ghost-like something. We're following a live human being who lived the life that we lived and who, who plunged himself into the depth of reality that is the same reality for you and me. That's the truth of Jesus. And that's why it's so critical for us to hear in these early narrative moments of gospel the truth of who Jesus was. In the wilderness, 40 days, tempted, tempted. Mark doesn't go into the temptations. The other gospels open that up. You know, on the highest hill, look at all the kingdoms. They can be yours. You can be, you can be Grand Poobah, the master. The hero of the world. People can bow down and praise you and praise you and praise you and bring all kinds of stuff to you and you can be mighty and powerful. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Or you can be flung to the very top of the pinnacles of the temple. So jump down from here. God will send his angels for he will not let his beloved son perish. And people will see this marvel, and they will come and worship you and hold you in such reverence. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You see, what Jesus was doing was turning away all of the fakey stuff that the world hungers to grab a hold of. Jesus is not telling fake news. Jesus is telling the truth in the very living of his life. And he plunged to the depth of humanity in 40 days in the wilderness. He didn't run away from it, but he gathered it in. If Jesus had never been tempted, what meaning would his sacrificial life be? If Jesus had not experienced the reality of humanity, what difference would it make if he had been hung on a cross? But because he gathered in the reality of temptation, he was willing to face the unimaginable He was willing to embrace the reality of authentic existence that was not simply what the world saw with their eyes or tried to figure out with their minds, but was the reality that was the very depth of God's presence in the midst of God's creation.
So can you understand how the writer of 1 Peter said, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all. For you see, as Jesus took on the reality of temptation, as Jesus gathered the truth of the sinfulness, the brokenness, the apartness from God that all of us experience and are capable of dealing with, as Jesus gathered that all in and didn't run away from it and didn't hide from it and didn't deny it, and didn't try to sugarcoat it. As Jesus gathered it all in, in his suffering, in his agony, in his hurt, as he faced the unimaginable, the unimaginable of what the world can do to any of us, anything, how the world can play games, horrible games, terrible games, death-making games, games on a cross. As Jesus gathered that all in and didn't run from it, but lived through it, into the very death event so that God might then speak God's final word of resurrection. And so all of the sins that we're capable of suddenly come into a new perspective as we understand that the God that we are called to worship and to be a part of the God who claims us for life, the God who calls us sons and daughters, the God who invites us to participate with God in the ongoing creation, even to this day. That we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. When we try to save ourselves, we die. And when we are willing to relinquish all and to live the authentic truth of God's redemptive love, we come alive as nothing else can ever free us. And so we can face temptation. You know, I was thinking about temptation. You know, uh, we use that always, and we tend to use that in the negative sense, but the truth is that temptation has both positive and negative ramifications. For example, I can be tempted to taste that yummy cake. <laughs> That's not bad, is it? <laughs> I, can be, I can be tempted to risk a new life direction, a profession, a job, a journey, a relationship. I can be tempted to, to step into a place that I never imagined myself to be before. Those are all good temptations. See, temptation in and of itself is not negative. Now, I can be tempted to do some pretty no-no things. <laughs> I don't need to illuminate that, do I? <laughs> We've all got a pretty good understanding of that one already. So the issue is not temptation. The issue is who's the tempter or what's the tempter? We pray, lead us not into temptation. Other ancient renderings of the text say, lead us not to the tempter. Lead us not to the one who will mislead us, misguide us. Give us the fake news. Give us the, the crazy stories. Give us the unreality of life. Cause our minds to, to explode into a, into a variety of ways that can simply cause our emotions to get out of control and do crazy things. 
like we've seen in recent weeks and will probably continue to see. Who's the tempter? For God, through Jesus Christ, does not tempt us into that kind of negative spiral downward to death. And as Christians, you and I need to be clear about that and be willing to say forthrightly, no matter how we feel about a whole variety of social and economic issues, that's not the point. The point is, how do we understand the living of our life in authentic, God-led direction? However else we sort out the rest of the stuff, that's, that, that's a variety of opinions, that's okay. But let's be clear that we're not, God does not call us to be at war with each other. And it's time for Christians to be willing to stand up forthrightly and to face the unimaginable. And to say no where no needs to be said. Not with malice and anger, but simply, no, I'm not going to live my life there. For I understand that my life is normed by God through Jesus Christ, and that calls me to a place of love and compassion and care. That means when my brother and sister's hurting, I'm going to do something about it. And if you want to put some kind of ism to it, like socialism, that's your problem. But I'm a God-fearing follower of Jesus, and I'm going to care authentically about my brothers and sisters who are hurting. And that doesn't mean free giveaway programs. It means authentic caring. Breaks my heart that people died in Texas in the cold. It breaks my heart that, that black and brown communities are suffering more than white communities. It breaks my heart when we simply are not caring for each other right from the get-go as God calls us. I don't care what you say and what you, how you feel. The truth is, is that Jesus fits into the black and brown communities more than the white community, ethnically. And he would have been treated hmm, in unimaginable ways. But God forgives us and God will help us. And we must, we must allow God to be the norming truth of our daily lives. Caring about each other, working through issues. You know, the Texas had their own power grid because they didn't want to be normed by any federal guidelines. Rowdy Dow, it sure didn't work out, did it? As though federal guidelines are somehow a no-no in life. We're a whole country. We're a whole world. Why shouldn't we have normative guidelines that help give us all direction and security and safety and vision and possibility. How we can behave in such inward selfish ways and how we pay the price for it again and again and again. Well, we are called to not walk into the tempting moments, the negative tempting moments of life. And goodness only knows there's plenty of them there. We are called to face the unimaginable with God's love and grace, with a commitment and power that simply transforms who 
Each of us are as an individual, who we are as a family, who we are as a faith family, who we are as God's people. During this time of Lent, may God add blessing to us on this amazing journey. Our prayer hymn, Jesus Calls Us. Jesus, call us. Call us. We are listening. Gracious and holy God, as we gather into this Lenten journey, we are so profoundly aware of the contentious nature of the culture that we now live in. It doesn't have to be that way. We can have differences of opinion, but we don't have to hurt each other. We can find solutions together. We can make things work. But God, as followers of Jesus, we know that we must first hear you before anything else. For it is in you alone that we have our life and breath. It is in you alone that our existence depends. As the psalmist said, where can I go? Where can I flee from your spirit? If I descend to heaven, if I rise to heaven and descend to hell, Sheol, no matter where I go, you are there. And so, God, with humbleness, we gather before you. With thanksgiving in our hearts that you love us so much so much that you allow Jesus to walk into the wilderness for 40 days. May we walk into our wilderness places for the next 40 days. And may we journey beyond the wilderness to the day of your eternity. We pray for loved ones. We've named so many aloud. We name others in our hearts. May we reach out with love and compassion to each and every one of these, our loved ones, caring for each other in the hurts and pains and struggles of life. Let us continue to lift each other up, to bear one another's burdens in appropriate ways. Be with our leaders 
here in this community, all the communities are be with those who struggle to climb out of the chaos of, of the weather pandemic as well as the viral pandemic. Bring to us new life, new health, new vision, new possibilities. For we pray this in the name of the Jesus that still calls and to whom we still follow and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into the heart of the tempter. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Our closing hymn, I, tr I pray the words be true. I have decided to follow Jesus. Judy, as always, you just choose the right music. I'm so appreciative. The words are powerful. Um, following the benediction, the ushers will dismiss us. And I want to encourage us, don't, don't get in the little cluster out there right outside. <laughs> Keep walking down the hallway. <laughs> I know it's so exciting to see each other, isn't it? <laughs> I had to laugh. Kevin is such a an unhumorless person, you know that. He just has no sense of humor at all. So what he said to me this morning was that it had been so long since he had been at church, he had to enter the church address into his map finder so he could get it, find his way here. <laughs> oh, gosh. It is good, so good to be together. Again, Melvin, for the beautiful flowers, for the loving memory of Phyllis. And so may God who comes to us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, bless, preserve, and keep each and every one of us surely this day and even forevermore. All of God's people said in their mind and their heart, Amen and Amen.